Cool. So this is going to be um, a little bit about uh, GraphSync, try to get everyone here at least uh, to the point of understanding the basic kind of like architectural stuff um, and like maybe feeling like you know something about it enough so that we could maybe like if you were to be assigned a ticket in GraphSync, you might be able to make progress even if it was like a smallish ticket maybe. Um, so yeah. So that's that. That's what we're doing. Um, uh, first of all, what is GraphSync? Um, GraphSync is a network protocol to synchronize IPLD graphs across peers. Um, a very short description, but a key a couple important uh, elements here. Uh, IPLD graphs. So so. Um, GraphSync is a protocol to 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 transfer data at the level of IPLD, the IPLD data model, um, which is a model for structured data, structured content address data um, uh, that is linked together um, on, the, on the distributed web. And that's gonna be important when we get to stuff like, um, uh, when we get stuff like, like, uh, sorry, it's, let me rewind. The, the thing that's important about that is that uh, to trans to synchronize IPLD graphs on the internet, both both sides have to understand IPLD, um, and that can be uh, that that's a slightly higher bar than say BitSwap, which is our other main transport, um, which operates solely at the block level. Um, that just means both sides have to understand like content address uh, content addresses and um, and just like serialized blocks. Um, anyway, so let's, so that's that's the first piece. Um, uh, and uh, we we're going to be syn synchronizing across peers. Um, so we are going to be, this is primarily a protocol that operates in libp 2 p at least for now, um, uh, and is oriented towards peer-to-peer uh, uh, -to -peer distribution, distributed data where the peers don't necessarily trust each other. So um, let's talk about our, this work. let's talk about our goals for GraphSync. Oh, I have this on now. We have this on a peer mode. Um, the first thing about GraphSync is that it is a trustless protocol. Um, uh, and the goal is for the data that you transfer over GraphSync to be incrementally verifiable. Um, so that's a pretty key guarantee is that when you make a request with GraphSync, you should um, not be accepting um, any data that you cannot verify as the data you requested. Um, and that should be done in reasonable chunks so that you do not have to take in like a gig of data um, before you are able to verify that it's the right data. Um, that's an important guarantee when you don't necessarily trust the other person, um, but you do have a content uh, address at the root of your graph. Um, so you can, so you're verifying against that root content address um, it's a little bit more complicated because you're verifying a graph um, and you uh, can't really verify blocks past the first one until you have, um, until you essentially perform the select or traversal to get down to them. We'll get into that in a, in a second. Um, GraphSync is, uh, is generally um, designed ideally to be resilient and attack resistant, um, particularly on the side that is responding to incoming requests, um, because you are effectively, you know, you have an open protocol address on the, on the internet. Um, so you have to do things, um, you know, to mitigate DDoS potential attacks and to mitigate things that could basically consume resources in an unbounded way on your system. Um, it ideally is performant. We should be able to serve lots of requests at once. We should be able to make lots of requests at once. Um, it should be able to sort of operate in parallel um, and it should be able to do so in relatively efficient ways. Um, and then the other, the other big thing about GraphSync, particularly as, it, as compared to BitSwap, is that it's very configurable. Um, there's a lot of ability in GraphSync to um, change request behavior um, over the course of the request um, and to make lots of changes to like where you're loading data from uh, on your local disk, um, which is, those are, those are things that could be in BitSwap but are primarily not in BitSwap today. So that it, uh, not, part of the reason they're in GrassSync is because it was sort of written post uh, BitSwap. So we added lots of stuff. Uh, by the way, before I go any farther, um, this is like interactive presentation, so please interrupt me because like I don't have like lots of entertainment and jokes uh, for this this presentation. So if you want to stay interested, stay uh, 
Bring your own jokes, yes. And also like, you know, I feel like, like when you don't have a lot of, you know, if you don't have a lot of jokes then a long, long uninterrupted talking gets a little overwhelming. Um, anyway, uh, so just looking at the, over, the, the like super highest level architecture of GraphSync, um, we have, uh, GraphSync has a top level interface. These are the methods that you can call as a person who is using GraphSync. Um, and that's like, there's basically one thing you construct and that's your top level interface. Everything else is constructed underneath that. Um, uh, you have, uh, and then in terms of the code itself, uh, there's a, it's sort of divided up into three other major components besides the top level interface. You have like a requester implementation. This is the side that is gonna make requests um, and process responses from the internet. Um, uh, you have a responder implementation, which is the, this is the side that's gonna receive incoming requests um, and serve them. Um, and then you have a message sending layer. Um, and we'll get into why there's a separate message sending layer uh, in a minute. Uh, it'll probably become a, uh, it become apparent why this is an important architectural sort of like design where that part is taken away from everything else. But essentially this thing is uh, managing as people wish to send requests or responses over the internet. It's sort of like gathering, collecting, and then sending them out in discrete network messages. Um, so uh, just sidebar about terminology, um, I'm gonna say, requester and responder and you can vaguely think of this as requester is like the client and responder is like the server with the caveat that you can't really think of them that way because we're in peer-to-peer -peer context right the reason that they're the reason we use requester and responder is that theoretically um on a lib peer-to-peer -peer network anyone can send a request and anyone can serve a response everyone is running the response responder implementation this is obviously different than like http where there's like someone who is the server and someone who is the client so yes but, but in you previously said it's a synchronization and yes. in a individual session, it looks one way from the responder to the request. And an individual request. Yes, that is the case. Um, it flows one way. The, the distinction being that if you were to think about, compared to like HTTP, um, basically everyone on the internet is either running a web browser or a web server, and they're not running something that does both. Um, everyone who runs GraphSync is running both. So um, that's the that's the main distinction. Um, Grassing has just a, just a couple of dependencies uh, that it, it needs like this this network implementation um, dependency. It's, this is just a really simple wrapper around the lib P2P protocol to, to like be able to send and receive messages. And it mostly exists so that in testing in GraphSync, you can basically take lib P2P out of it if you don't want um, to actually talk over the network. Um, and then it, take, it needs a default, um, essentially, implementation of a local storage as expressed through an IPLD link system instance. Um, so for those of you guys who know IPLD Prime, link system is effectively now the mechanism by which you configure the loading and storing of IPLD data from disk. Um, uh, so it does need a default link system. Um, you will see in a bit that you can change a lot of that. That's all you really need to supply to it. Um, I just wanna talk briefly about like all the things that have to happen in a, in a round trip. And these are all what the goal of essentially serving an incre incrementally verifiable IPLD uh, selector traversal request, right? Uh, so starting on the requester side, they need to encode and send the request to the responder. That part's pretty simple. Um, once they have sent it and the responder receives it, they need to receive it and they need to start uh, running an IPLD selector traversal, right? Um, so uh, the way IPLD selector traversals work is you, you essentially tell IPLD to, you give it a root, a root node and a selector um, to perform the traversal and you also give it a link system. And the way it works with that link system is that every time in the process of uh, running that query, every time it gets to a link boundary, it's going to call out to the link system to load the, um, load the, um, the next block uh, in the traversal from disk, um, and then uh, and then continue on with the traversal. Um, so uh, what the responder is going to do is it's going to load the blocks um, from the local storage to back the selector 
query. Um, it also needs to encode and send those blocks that it's traversed and metadata about that traversal um, to back to the requester over the network, right? Meanwhile, on the requester side, they need to verify the blocks that they get from the responder. Because again, we can't just trust the blocks that they, they get from the responder. And the way we do this is we perform our oh, we perform the exact same selector traversal query backed by the network responses on the requesting side. Um, and, uh, and then the requester stores the blocks to its local store as those blocks are verified. Um, by running this local traverse. Um, and finally, the requester returns traversed IPLD nodes to whoever called the request method. Yes. How is the verification of your own selector done if you have any so, so you go to the boundary and you yeah. see it there. Yep. The link makes sense. And then for the next block, you check if the link or how is the so, so like, so you're saying like, so if I'm running this selective traversal, I get to the link boundary. Now I need to load, right? What I mean is that the, the, the verification you're doing in the requester side, I'm receiving, so, so I perform the selector. Mm -hmm. uh, you start giving me one mm -hmm. fact, and you're saying that we're verifying ourselves that the blocks you're sending me belong mm -hmm. to the request, the selector request that I sent you. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. How is this done if you don't have all of the blocks? Yes, you do not have all the blocks yet. So this is this is actually part of the the core complicated part of this. Um, you you so we know that when we run a selector traversal in IPLD, it's going to run its own code until it gets to a block boundary. At that point, it's going to say load this block, and that's where that's where the requester is going to do a lot of magic. And in fact. That's the next slide. Is this like core like thing that happens on both sides is, is intercepting the process of loading blocks and doing other things there. And that's basically the, the mechanism by which everything happens <laughs> in, in to, to a large extent in grassing, right? So on the requester side, we're running this selector traversal. We get to a blocker block boundary, and now we need to wait until we have the block to load from the network, right? Um, and uh, so we're gonna, so at this point we get to that point and we essentially block the traversal while in a separate thread, we're waiting for, you know, responses to come in. As a response comes in, we're like, oh, we now we have that block that we wanted for this part. We're going to unblock it by providing it that block. We're also going to, at that moment say, well, now <coughs> that the traversal asked for this block and we got it back from the network, um, we know that it's a verified block, so we need to now write that to local storage at that moment, right? And this is all happening in the block loader function. Um, and meanwhile, uh, the other thing is that we might, that we do is we're, in, in order to be efficient, if we're performing a selector traversal um, in a grass sync request and it encounters the same block twice, we are only going to send it once. And the second time, what we can do is, since we already got it and we put it in our local storage, we can fall back and be like, do we have this in local storage? Oh, if we have it in local storage, then we'll just read it, right? Um, and then in that way, the, the responder doesn't have to send it twice. So that's, that's the sort of funkiness on the requester side. Um, and there's also, the other thing we're gonna do in there is we are going to um, call like hooks to be like, oh, we got a block, you know, do, do what, what do you wanna do with this block uh, to anybody who's registered a hook? Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah. When you register a hook, you may register more than one, right? You can register more than one for almost every hook, and yes. what is the order? The, the order is currently just order of being registered. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can unsubscribe a hook to, to, to unregister. Yeah, go ahead. In the previous slide, it said something like the uh, responder includes a block to send it to the requester. Uh -huh. uh, but wouldn't the responder already have the encoded block somewhere? Because it loaded the block from somewhere? Sorry, that is correct. It, it, when I say encode, I meant it put a block in a network message, not take IPLD and write it to a serialized form. Um, yeah, you're, you, no, no, that's, that's probably confusing terminology because of what it, what it, what, yeah, what I mean to say is you need to build, build a network message with like all the things you need. And that's the same thing. Like the responder has the same like concept of an interception, right? Like when you, when it says like, time to load a new block, we load it for local storage, but then before you hand back control, 
you send the block and other metadata over the network, right? And <laughs> it also in that moment calls hooks. And this is actually really important because one of the hooks, one of the things you can do in a block hook on GraphSync um, responder is pause the request, um, which is one of the, the tricks by which the whole retrieval market payment protocol works is pausing and resuming requests. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like the basics. Um, I want to look briefly at the graphing message format, which will hopefully illustrate why there's like a whole message sending layer. Um, and this is, one could argue this is not the, like, this is worth, worth a revisit. Um, <laughs> so a graph sync me network message is a protobuf. Um, probably at some point, actually there's a proposal to just take this and rewrite it in CBOR so that it would be, um, and make sure that it matches the IPLD spec so that it has like a, an IPLD schema to describe it. Um, but for the moment, it's a protobuf. Um, and uh, the thing that's interesting about this, I don't know, do you, do you all know how, like if I go through this, this is protobuf, description format, hopefully it makes some sense. Um, you can see that in, within the graph sync message, we've just defined a request type and a response type and a block type. And then the actual content of the message is just a list of requests, a list of responses, and a set of blocks. So that's a, it's an interesting message format. Um, it's, it's not exactly the simplest message format because you can have multiple requests, multiple responses, and blocks in the uh, in a single message, right? Um, uh, and the other thing that's interesting about this is you'll see that there's not an obvious in the current uh, message format. There's not an obvious uh, connection between uh, the blocks you receive and which responses they were part of. <laughs> um, the there actually is in every graph sync message that encoding. Um, uh, but right now it is one of these, uh, you can see each, both the request and the response have a map from string to bytes of extensions. This is, you can basically pack arbitrary extensions into graphs of messages. Um, the, uh, the thing that is. So there's a response extension that says what's it. What SIDs were, were encountered and that in the, in that response extension is called response metadata. And it needs to move out of the extension category and into the core protocol category. It just has not happened yet. Um, in any case, I'm going to just briefly go over to that so you can see that. Um, Every is sent at least twice. What do you? Uh, well, uh, yes and no. Yeah, it's sent here, and then it's also sent in the response metadata. The reason that it's sent in the response metadata um, is that there, it also includes a core other piece, which is uh, here. I'm going to just pull this up. This is the known extensions. Um, there's, Why uh, did we structure it this way rather than embedding blocks directly in response metadata? Or yes. So, a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, that protocol was designed. Uh, that message format was designed in 2018 by people who really understood BitSwap. Um, uh, and like, I think looking at it right now, like I feel like if I were to, to do it, I would redo it differently. And also when I implemented it, that was sort of like presented as, a, a as the message format. And then like, like that spec existed with that message format for the most part, obviously it's changed a few times. Um, and I, like, I was like, okay, sure, yeah, I'll implement it that way. And now I'm like, there are some reasons, right? First of all, like two different responses might contain the same block, right? And there, ideally you should probably not send it twice if both responses contain the same block in the same message. Um, the, uh, so when you look at this- separate messages, though, wouldn't you not want to pass that block the second time? If they're separate messages, you, also, so that's an interesting thing about like one of the most interesting questions in GraphSync's responder implementation is how often should you duplicate blocks, right? There's two things that seem fairly simple. One is that if two different responses send the same block and the same message, you probably shouldn't send it twice, right? The other is if the same request encounters the same block twice at two different parts of the traversal, you probably shouldn't send it twice. 
once you go beyond that, there's some really interesting questions, right? Because like a responder could, um, <clears throat> they, they could, simply never send the same peer at the same block twice, right? But now they're tracking peers that like, you know, for theoretically in perpetuity and basically maintaining a list of what SIDS they have. So obviously they're not gonna do that forever. Um, the implementation of Go Graph Sync makes this sort of like, um, I don't know, like what seemed like a, a, a fairly logical decision at the time, um, which is, uh, essentially, if I have two requests, if I have a request in progress from, from a peer and I have another request in progress from a peer, if you encounter the same block twice in each request, but in a different message, as long as they're both in progress, I'm going to go ahead and say, let's not send it again, right? Um, so that's sort of like the best case. The spec doesn't, doesn't say what the deduplication logic is, which is interesting. Um, and something that I've put in a revised proposal is to actually say from a pure like what must every requester who absorbs in a uh, graph sync you know responses like all they need to support by default is not is deduplicating within the same request and deduplicating within the same message because those are simple cases right now the go implementation supports this more fancy case and it also and it adds a ton of complexity to the code um, because yeah, there's a lot of a lot of challenges, particularly when you start actually on the requesting side, writing your responses to different block stores. Because now, like your deduplication is actually going to be super different than you expected. So anyway, there's a bunch of things to deal with that right now. Um, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. Um, the link metadata um, that or the the response metadata it's really simple. Uh, it's just a list, uh, an array. This is a Seabor encoded IPLD node, um, and uh, and all it is is a, a list of data structures that contain a SID and whether or not the block was present on the responder, meaning like whether or not the responder had that block. That is important because one of the things we support with GraphSync or we intend to support uh, is partial responses, meaning the server executed their selector traversal to the best of the but we're missing some of the blocks, which means that they had to stop the traversal of that block there. That mean they may have actually had some of the blocks underneath it, but as soon as it hits something, it can't go past, like it's gonna skip over that and say, I didn't have this block. So then on the other side, the, other, the requester can look at that and be like, oh, you didn't have that block. So I'm gonna just continue the traversal, even though, even though I know that I'm never gonna get that block. So you have a question? Yeah. The cleanup is done by default. So we use several main systems, as you suggested. Yep. We're going to face this problem. Yeah, there is an extension specifically for the. So basically, there is a there's a thing. Uh, there's an extension called GraphSync dedupe by key. Uh, we ended up using this because we use multiple link systems in Filecoin uh, to because every request response goes to a separate. Uh, effectively writes a separate car file now. Um, and uh, so it's going to go to a different place. So when the requester sends the, um, when they send the, when they send the request, they say, this is the key by which you should dedupe. And basically any requests that do not share this key uh, should not be dedupe with this request. So, um, and that I believe is automatic in GraphSync if you use an alternate link system. I believe the requester implementation will send that without you having to do so that. Segments, the it segments all the, the deduplication. Yep. Yeah. If I request a large graph of data, uh -huh. uh, but I know I've got blocks that will most likely still be useful for this graph, mm -hmm. can I, as a requester, can I say that as part of a request? Like, hey, by the way, yep. these CIDs already happened from like days ago. Yes, we have it. We have exactly an extension for that called "Do Not Send SIDS." Uh, what? Sort of. So that that does not send those specific blocks, but it does not send those specific subnets. So it will yep. it will not it will deduplicate that individual block. But it's not the whole subnet, and that is the yes, and it would be good to have a a, a subnet deduplicator. Um, anyway, so that's, that's, that's that thing. Yeah, that was like literally the most simple version of that that we could write and we use it. We totally 
kind of like use and misuse uh, it in our data transfer to do restarts because right now a restart and data transfer is done by sending the request again with every single SID you've already transferred, you've already traversed. Yes, um, there are people on Ignite who probably hate me for that. Um, in any case, yeah, so those, those are some things. Uh, where were we? But it's hard to say what the efficient sub diagram. I mean, if you can do a SID. Like, like, how would you know how to, like, if, so imagine that we go from do not send SIDs with the individual SIDs to do not send, do not traverse past sub -dags of these SIDs. Yes. And I've got my partial car file. Yes. I guess I've got my selector and somehow with the selector and that partial set of SIDs in the car file, I can figure out yeah. how I to collapse into the minimal number of sub -dags that I want to not be traversed past because I completed them. Probably the so most also non yeah no that actually is probably not the most efficient version of the resume request. Most likely, we need to have an extension that's like, don't send me the first n bytes you would have sent me over the the network. Though that's also not totally simple. Probably more like you. you oh God, there's a bunch of different things for doing. Um, resuming requests that are probably better implementations than do not send individual SIDs, but like do not send individual SIDs is really easy to write. So <laughs> yeah. This might send you in a, in a bit of a rabbit hole, uh, but if a traversal is deterministic, can you like say the last state that I received was this, can I resume from this point? Possibly if we had a way to express that. At the moment, I don't know if we have a right way to express that. Like, but like, we don't have a well, way. The scary thing is that you can ask for a lot of work from the server, in that it potentially has to do the whole traversal and go to the left. Or in, if you do it in an invalid position, for instance, it's got to replay the entire selector and all of that this kind of work. And then at the end, it's like, oh, I need next. Yeah. The, another thing that's, in, I mean, interesting thing generally about graph sync is that the, for the responder, you're basically asking them to do a lot of work every time you make a graph sync request. So the responder has to be like, you have to be pretty careful in what you allow the responder, like what kinds of requests it serves, what kinds of like, for example, in Filecoin, we have a one of the big, one of the most core hooks is like a hook that allows you to look at an incoming request and decide if you want to serve it. Um, and we use that in Filecoin to like be like, well, if it's a data transfer that's connected to a storage or retrieval deal that these two parties have already agreed to, then yeah, let's go ahead and, and serve it, um, uh, no matter what the selector is. But the default implementation that was originally written um, based off of the idea of putting it in IPFS. Um, is that you would serve certain kinds of selectors, but not other kinds of selectors. Another thing that you might, but but actually the current check for that is really not a great check for as a like, let's not serve like a really, you know, infinitely long request. Um, you probably instead want to do, like right now it's based off of like the recursion limit on a recursive selector, which is naturally pretty ineffective for certain types of DAGs. Um, so what you probably want to do is do something like, I don't know, only serve uh, selectors up to a certain number of blocks or something like that. That's probably a, a reasonable way to be safe in an untrusted environment. Again, in the file point environment, all requests for graph sync will be rejected unless they are validated as part of storage or retrieval deals. Um, what else can we say about the graph sync? Oh, right. So we saw this like pretty funky message format. Um, I want to just talk briefly about how that all leads into the um, the architecture of graph sync. Right. Um, one of the interesting things is because this message format is going to be combining messages um, uh, for requests and responses and deduplicating. Um, uh, in, we have a whole separate layer that's like a message sending layer that you basically just say, hey, I want to add this uh, request to the next outgoing message, or I want to add this response to the next outgoing message, I want to add these blocks to it. Um, and that is 
and basically you have a running thread that's like a message queue per peer that like basically a set, you know, lets you keep assembling things until the next message goes out and then takes everything you've assembled, puts it into the queue, sends it while you build the next message. Um, so that's what this whole message sending layer does. Um, it also does some interesting things like you probably like it needs to know when to like cut off a message because you're building too large of a message. So um, after you've added a certain size of blocks to a message, um, if you try to add another one, it's gonna it's gonna actually go right to the next message instead of um, continuing within that message. So that's that's another thing to know. Um, this this is sort of like a high level flow of like all of the things that are happening in GraphSync, including all the threads. There are a lot of threads in GraphSync. Um, you have, uh, so there's like basically two ways the top level interface gets called. The main one that you're gonna be working with is like calling the request method that initiates a new request. But the other big thing that actually goes right into uh, the top level interface is when incoming network traffic comes in on the GraphSync handler. Um, it goes right into a couple of methods onto the, on the top level interface um if you have a request if you want to if they if somebody requested making an outgoing request uh or you receive an incoming response it goes over to the the requester implementation which is called the request manager um these probably should be should probably be called requester in, instead of like request manager because it sounds like you're like you could be managing incoming requests but it actually means managing outgoing requests um and then if you have an incoming request you go over to the response manager which again is generating responses to incoming requests which again probably these could use a rename actually as as we're say, as i'm saying them aloud um in any case uh yeah within the request manager like another thing about to know about this is like the request manager has its own independent thread that runs and basically is like the single thread for everything that comes in and all the other things that can happen there's an internal in, internal thread in the request manager um and uh you're gonna uh, send this in it's going to send the request uh if it's an outgoing request it's going to send it to the network if it is an incoming response, it's going to feed it into this module called the async loader. Um, and that is the thing, one of the hardest parts is figuring out how to deal with the problem of you're running this traversal to verify. And meanwhile, you're receiving blocks at totally unknown times. You're receiving them for like multiple responses at once, uh, potentially, and you have to figure out how to feed these incoming blocks to the right selector queries. Um, and so this, this async loader is the thing that does all that magic. Um, it's relatively complicated because it's got basically, when it gets new response, like when you when you ask it to load a block, it like tries to load it immediately. If it can't, it, like instead of loading, instead of returning a, an actual block, it returns a channel that's gonna return a, a response once it's done. Um, and so then like, meanwhile, like, as it gets new responses, it looks at all of these like held up requests to load blocks and it like feeds the responses to those blocks. In any case, meanwhile, while that's happening, you have independent threads, you have a, this is probably need a, re, a rename, but you have independent threads executing these selectors, right? Getting fed blocks as they come in from the network. And then once you traverse the blocks and, and, and you want to serve it back to the person called request, one of them, uh, possibly not great design choices, but also kind of nice from a usability standpoint is that like when you call crossing that request, you get channels back, you can read them whenever you so choose because GrassLink has a whole separate thread for your request to collect all the, collect everything and essentially infinite buffer the channel for you, um, which is super cool and also potentially probably uh, a possible memory problem if you were to do a huge response, a uh, huge request and never read any of the responses. Um, in any case, yeah, so they're in a, in a couple of different places. Um, there's a couple of things. First of all, when you make a request to, using the request method on the top level, um, you can um, you can uh, you can pass it extensions. In the to the request method, and they will go out with the encoded request. Um, you uh, there when you do. Um, there's a couple places you can see extensions. Otherwise, are primarily handled by hooks. 
right? Because the idea is that hooks are the user supplied code. They're the ones that are going to be caring about like uh, what extensions are in the request, um, with the exception of the metadata piece, which is like built into grassing. Um, and also like the handling of do not send SIDs on the re responder side is is also built into grassing. But for the most part, you're going to assume that they they live uh, except for in well-known extensions are going to be handled by user code in hooks. Um, and so you're going to see a couple hooks here. There is one uh, on the requester side, you can encode, uh, you can intercept at the point you get an incoming network message. I believe there's like or an incoming network response. That's it, like the like intercept it's like register incoming response hook. I think it's, it's an incoming response hook. There's also an incoming block hook at the point the block is actually verified. Um, and, and, and the basic structure of hooks, I'm gonna pull up, I think I've got the grass and code up here somewhere. Um, I don't wanna derail No, no, it's cool. Cause I wanna talk, actually, you know what? I do wanna talk about hooks, but let's talk about them in a minute, if that's cool. Um, yes, go for it, another side. Yeah, no, 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 you're good, you're good. Is it possible for the list of known extensions to be consistent across rooms? Uh, the so yes, in the sense that no graph sync implementation is required to know about any extension other than the request metadata extension, and that one should not be an extension. It needs to go into the core protocol. The assumption is if you you know if it's an extension, not everyone knows about it. The list of known extensions is just purely a specification. So, and, and that's like basically these extensions are ones that we, you might want to like know some, might want to do something with. But the idea is you can do arbitrary extensions. And then, like, for example, data transfer has all, it has its whole own set of extensions, but they are not part of the known extensions list because it's not, it's not assumed that someone who is implementing GraphSync would care about those extensions. They would be implemented via like hooks into an implementation of grassic. So then this follow-up question from that. Yep. If, what would happen if I load a request with lots of extensions? Mm -hmm. What? If I maliciously load a request with lots of different extensions that's probably that is unknown to everybody. Yes. Uh, They're just gonna get ignored. Uh, Unless okay. the other person has written code to handle those extensions. Do they not get sent to the next year? Like, they get sent to the, yeah, wait, do oh, they? Not necessarily. I mean, a grass sync request is only going to one peer. I see. And, and although you could technically pack lots of extensions into a, into a grass sync request, it, uh, like, there's a message size limit. So you actually couldn't, like, it's only like four megabytes that you could put into a single message. Um, so, so I mean, like you can definitely pack lots of extensions. The problem is that the other side doesn't care about them. Like it's just going to look at them and be like, I don't know what to do these and just ignore them. Okay, so yeah. My, my understanding was uh, traversal happens recursively. Like if I ask you, you ask someone else, then it goes in. Whereas it starts from one here and then goes to you. Yeah, a, a, a single traversal is 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 a a single graphic request is from one peer to another peer for an entire traversal. Yeah, um, and so yeah, so the single peer at the at least at the moment we don't have any like request farming where like you know like um, there are a lot of one of the things that's interesting about GrassSync in the long term is like to work well in terms of like fast downloading is you probably want to do this with you want to make sure that your request is served by multiple peers. So then you have to figure out how to break up the request, um, which is not necessarily obvious. Um, when you do a, with BitSwap, it's really easy to break up requests because you're asking for individual blocks and they are verifiable as a unit, right? Like, so like if I ask for a block, you send me back bytes for that block, I can verify it against the SID I asked for and that's all I have to do, right? So that means that if I'm doing a DAG traversal I run that traversal locally. I run it with lots of threads. I end up with lots of blocks I need at once, and I just send different blocks, different block requests to different uh, peers. So it's pretty easy to split up. GrassSync is more complicated to split up because you effectively have to split the selector, which 
requires a bunch of, you know, I mean, like we, means your selector language has to have a lot of cool ways of splitting things up. Yeah. You look like you have another. Would it be possible to, because now that you're living with this one. Yeah, yeah. Would it be possible to make graphs in not one-to-one -one in the sense that, I mean, we have a message, a request response. For mm -hmm. example, yeah. Can we send like selectors? To BitSwap? Yeah. No, no, no. What I mean is like, instead of, Putting like the list of CIDs, yeah. would it make sense to send selectors in BitSwap and all these extensions and all these like the same message format? So, so the interesting thing about so the, the, the hardest part about selectors is that you can't verify all the results unless you run the selector. But you have well, the same loader, right? What? I'm thinking, uh, you have the same loader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I send you a request, yes, and I send like then another request, start getting logs from you both. Sure. I could have a, a, a bit sort of that understands the lectures, right? Because- You could, I mean, then it would just be graphs, right? Like but there's- But it's one-to-one, -one, right? It's no, so it's only one-to-one -one in the sense that like the Go implementation doesn't do splitting up of requests. Like the actual right. format, you can send it to lots of people. So it could be a, a wrapper, like a bit swap wrapper on top of graphing so that mm -hmm. we handle all of this like request orchestration, right? Yes, yes, that is, uh, I believe what you are referring to is like, like the equivalent of BitSwap sessions for grassing, yep. Yep. right? Yeah, and I believe that is like what I'm supposed to work on for like the next year. <laughs> it's like getting these I things to work. Yeah, <laughs> so there's also a bunch of really interesting things you might do uh, mixing the two. Um, one of the things that I'm most interested in, there's really only one problem with BitSwap, right? Which is that, I mean, there, well, there's a few problems, but like, uh, because you're dealing with bite-sized chunks, there's certain types of optimizations the other side can't do, but but the main problem with BitSwap is the nature of IPLD data and verifying, right? And the fact that you really can't do much, uh, you know, when you have a deeply nested DAG, I mean, you know, canonically like a blockchain is like the worst example for BitSwap because you can request the first block, get the results back, and then you go to the next level of the blockchain and you just go through the entire blockchain, but it's like this, like, like you know, a round trip for each height of the blockchain. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think you were, you may have seen this proposal, like from yeah. like when we were looking at different things, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. I like how to approach the yeah. transition it would be like going to the, I mean, going to pick stuff and, and plug it in the single loader or like yeah. just, which is let's do a router that's on the stand sessions. Yes. And each session is a graph thing on the liquid. Uh, yeah, and, and one thing I would imagine is that you could also do a version of, you, like, an easy thing to write would be to um, essentially write a graph, well, I mean, to modify the graphs and responder to not send the blocks themselves, which, like, you could, you know, add an extension that's like, don't send me the blocks, and just, so you end up with a list of sits, right, and so now you could run your selector traversal, you go ahead and make, you could sort of, like, optimistically make a bunch of requests for BitSwap for those SIDs, right? And then, uh, and, you, and that's easy to split up. Well, the yeah. That yeah. For certain DAGs, you, you have to wait for the CID list. Yes. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right, so if you have that CID list, you can essentially get around the BitSwap problem uh, while still using BitSwap, which is really easy to split requests. Um, the biggest problem, there, there's still the problem of like someone can just send you a malicious set um, uh, and then, you know, whatever, that just triggers a lot of additional processing on your part. But you could probably make it to like five different peers. And then if you get five sets back, if they vaguely match, they're most likely correct. You still verify them against the selector traversal, but you're probably not gonna incur some huge costs. But you still have that thing. Now with this one, because I could be sending you one CID one, yeah, and you would be sending me like any blog which is not the one I asked. Yes, that I, is true. I, I, again, it's yeah. still like a phone. Yeah. Still, like, I yeah. Think that's probably that is still Yes, that is that is true. Yeah, there there there's there's a bunch of yeah. You could build a lot of cool stuff. I mean, that sort of has never it's never quite happened. Partly because the grass sync use case ended up being Filecoin, which tended to continue to push it to more like configurability within an individual request as opposed to like that like distributed request thing. Um, 
And it's interesting because now we have a ton of configurability in VastSync and like all of it's missing from BitSwap. So like, you know, like you can't, you know, attach things to blocks or, you know, like basically there's like, how would we jam the payment system into BitSwap? It's definitely something about the protocol that is inherently anti-payments and payments for things, but like it still has to be written. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the, um, that's a lot of stuff that I think I just went over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's more, more things we can discuss in a, in a future. Oh, just to respond, because I do want to just, one more thing is to just go over the hooks briefly so that you can see how they work. Um, and like, uh, we can probably keep, um, working. Uh, yeah, they're, 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 this will just be a brief tour, but like, um, Maybe I just want to show you these so that like you know what's available. Uh, da, 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 da. Actually, let me just make this big. Is that what I want? No, I just want to get rid of this other window. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so you have a bunch of different ones. Uh, one of them is to register an alternate link system. This is useful. Um, this is register persistence option. You give it a you give it a link system and a name, and that becomes useful later for hooks. Um, uh, then you have uh, if you wanted to like configure a request to write to somewhere else, you have this register outgoing request hook. Um, and basically this would, you can't actually specify it in the call to request. You instead register an outgoing request hook and you say, you look at the request and you're like, oh, I'm going to, for this one, use this persistence option. Let me just show you how this end up, uh, ends up happening. Is like, you have this on outgoing block hook that you have to supply. This is a function you supply to it. Um, and the on outgoing block hook is gonna get, it's a function that's gonna get the peer, the request, uh, Oh, no, sorry, outgoing request hooks, apologies. The peer, the request, and this thing called hook actions. So hook actions are the things you can do within hooks to modify the request. If we were to go and look at this, the things you can do is you can change the persistence option. That's the thing I was just talking about. And then you could also use an alternate link node, target node prototype chooser. This would be if you wanted to do some crazy schema stuff, like to like configure this request to use an ADL or something. Uh, yeah, in any case. Um, yes. No, no. Hooks are completely local. And like the assumption is if you register a hook with local code that you're going to run on your machine and you provide that code, you are taking the risk that you are not putting anything in that hook that is like, you know, I mean, we, we trust the person who's calling register hook, who's a local computer user to not, uh, you know, I mean, if, if, if there's a thing in that hook that causes grassing to become unstable, it's considered the failure of the hook writer. Um, uh, What I was imagining was something from testing function, which is yeah. you could have, you could have a, a graph sync um, which could register hooks on the responder of the request. That would do different things in this. Yeah, the assumption is the mechanism for doing that is you send an extension and then the responder has to be able to read that extension and then in a hook and cause it to do something different. And the goal being there that the code doesn't run in the responder that isn't the responder's local code. Though theoretically, I guess one day we'll have Wasm and IPLD blocks and you can run all the code you want remotely. And surely that won't be any kind of a security risk at all. Um, Handling <laughs> Yes, with the except with the exception of the ones that go grass sync already implements itself, which are do not send SIDs and uh, it also implements dedupe by key. I think those are the only ones it knows how to, to just do. If you if, like, if you don't send if you send those extensions, even if you have no hook, it will know what to do with them, I believe. And then I believe there's one other. No, there's no other. The assumption is that basically GrassLink will handle any, any extension that it knows the requester side of GoGrassLink generated itself. 
like, or could have generated itself. So like, like dedupe by key will automatically get sent in the request if you call use persistence option in an outgoing request hook. So like that, that part is nice and that it's later like all handled for you. Um, uh, so yeah, that is the assumption. I mean, like right now, like this, it's not exactly like a fully like built out system with the extensions. The, the idea is that like, you can put whatever is in there and if the other person knows how to handle it in a hook or because they're whoever implemented it for their language knows how to handle put it in the built-in implementation then you know that's that's up to you so is there any existing hook that does the snowball thing i'm asking you something and the hook causes you to make it more uh there is no existing well there's there are Theoretically, someone could register an incoming request hook that did exactly that because it's user supplied code, right? So the only hooks that are registered right now for the most part are the data transfer hooks. Um, there are potentially, but anyone can register a hook, right? So like, it, like the, there's no code that would do that unless the person who is running graph syncs responder on their machine added code that they wanted to run in a like incoming request hook that would trigger further things. The, 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 where I'm going with all these silly questions is yeah. uh, the security thing you mentioned. You yeah. Know, and I'm trying to think how can I, or is it possible to cause an exponential traffic generation? You can absolutely write a hook and register it. It would do terrible things. The assumption is that since you're running this on your computer and you're the programmer who's initialized grass and can set it up with hooks, you are any user supplied code you put, you personally put on your own computer in a hook, right? Not a remote hook, right? Like it's, but you you are assuming the security risks for, for whatever code you supply. Um, so that is, that's sort of like, I, I don't think there's anything else you could do there. Because yeah, um, but there but there's a lot of like a lot of things that are in GraphSync are around like basically it's I mean this is like the security model that's is in my own head like my very probably misinterpretation of like the JavaScript security model which is like in the browser like you can kind of like in the browser anything that the user initiates or that somebody initiated by actually doing something with the GraphSync code is considered like that's like you know, you you can do whatever you want based off of that. Um, so like uh, one thing that's interesting is that like we deal with, we have a whole mechanism on the responder side to try to not process a bajillion incoming requests at once, right? Like if somebody sends me a thousand requests at the same time, uh, ideally that should get buffered in some fashion so that my computer doesn't go to a CPU 100% trying to process all those or disk 100%. Um, the assumption is on the other side because every outgoing request was initiated by someone calling request uh, that you can do as many as you want at once. Um, uh, but then that came up as a potential problem because data transfer has a mechanism via which the outgoing request is not initiated by someone calling the code, but rather someone sending a data transfer push request, which is like one of the main things data transfer implements is an addition, it essentially augments graph sync with a mode that that's called a push request, which means like I send you a request to send data to you. And then by sending you that request, if you say, I want to actually receive this data, you actually, the data transfer code initiates a graph sync request back to the original person to receive the data. Um, so that created problems because like if somebody, if like, in, in Filecoin right now, uh, if somebody sends you a hundred deals and you accept all of them, all those transfers are gonna get kicked off at once, which is problematic for Filecoin miners. Um, so yeah, there's some, there's some issues, um, though I think we're probably gonna end up putting request buffering, outgoing request buffering in grassing itself as opposed to data transfers. So. What's the order for this? Uh, depth first based off of like whatever the iteration of nodes is and lists and maps and IPLD, which I think is like, uh, well, I guess in lists, it's just the order of the list uh, by index. And then I guess in, in maps, I think it's actually predictably guaranteed to be- Sort the keys. Sort the keys, yeah, exactly. 
Um, and it's all single threaded depth first, which is its own potential problem in the future, just for performance issues. Um, Do you support asymmetric connectivity between peers? You have peers A, B, and C. Uh -huh. A can C, B. B can C. But right now, graphing is only one point. Okay. Yeah, the bit swap is like technically one to one as well. Like you can only, you, well, like. So graphing is actually different between A request and A response. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Right, where we're like doing the TTLs and like, you know, like, oh, we'll ask you for this block. If you don't have it, you ask this person next like, to you. We don't have connectivity with the end. I mean, even if you don't, putting the connectivity aside, the key advantage of that is proxy, like physical location. It might be faster or beneficial to me if uh, you could result, tell me something about the thing that I'm going to request. Because for you, it's much cheaper to find out, and it may mean that I no longer need to travel to the system. You could have scenarios that are yeah, no, there's a bunch of interesting. Well, one of the things that's interesting right now is that grassing is all transfer, no discovery. Um, BitSwap has a has a form of a discovery in it, in the sense that, like, in BitSwap, I can say. I want to know if you have this block, as opposed to I want to. I want you to send me this block. Um, uh, and Grassing doesn't have any functionality like that yet. Um, Actually, does it like you mentioned? Like I ask my neighbors and I say, any of you has it? And, and according to some of them, has it? You start getting blocks, and if not, you go to the DHC to find someone. So, yeah. So Bitcoin has it. Does he, so doesn't have that yet. It's a, it's a layer. But but the other thing, right, is. When we say the swap, we mean alternatively one of two things. We mean a transport protocol, but we also have this larger discovery mechanism that we say the twelve sessions sometimes to describe. And that's somewhat up at the idea of transfer level of grassing. And the grassing is more like the, se the session of just the transfer. Right? It's not and it's not really going to be a transfer between anything. Yeah, right? no, great grassing just doesn't have any of this. But the, the thing you were describing ends up looking a lot like composable routing or and, and think of um, Content routing is yeah. the term that we're often used for this. Um, and so we've got this smart records where you can have a record and something that's filled in by the person that you ask. And then you know, yeah. And that what? Was with that. But that's that, I think the hope is that that isn't in grassing or in BitSwap. That's like, that's yes, like, it's only confused because yeah. BitSwap already has it. Yes. <laughs> the, the actual, I mean, well, yeah. And it also, the protocol already has it, which, like, that's another question is whether, whether that. Discovery like a DAG based local discovery protocol would live in GrassSync or is it its own network protocol? I think some people have opinions on that, but yeah. yeah. Cool. Oh, sorry, that's yeah, let's call it. A yes. Some amount of 